Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 99. <clears throat> Please turn to the Lazarus marker of the seal of your hymnal to find the psalm that we read together this fall.
And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him, just as they were leaving. Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just as just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast him out, but they could not. Jesus answered, the faithless and per You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Lutheran sit in the back, huh? You wouldn't call the Lutheran splash them. For baptism, not for the The transfiguration of Christ is a familiar text to many of us. As Jesus makes his way to the crest of the mountain in conversation and prayer with his disciples, and maybe, just maybe, Pondering the next steps of his journey toward Jerusalem. His appearance becomes like a white no bleach on earth can manage. His glory, his divinity, no longer able to be contained in his humanity, breaks through and shines like the light we know him to be. Awestruck, as Matthew's Gospel notes, the disciples seek to preserve the situation by building three dwelling places for the newly arrived Elijah and Moses. Preserving the scene that has unfolded in front of them is all they can think of to do. Words can barely describe what is happening on top of the mountain. Even Luke is challenged by how to describe what is happening in just a singular moment. But before that voice descends, before the cloud engulfs the top of the mountain, I want to fill in the gaps, the pieces in the conversation that Luke alludes to in verse 31. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus had chosen Peter, James, and John to go up the mountain with him to pray. The higher up the mountain he climbs, the burden of the task laid before him gets heavier and heavier. His reaction to the burden is to enter into a place of prayer. An example I think we would do well learning how to do when life throws us enormous challenges. As his head bows, and tears of worry and fear begin to fall from his eyes. The same worry and fear we will again see in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus looks up and finds himself in the company of the saints. The faces of the two old faithfully departed patriarchs smile back at the worried young man before them. Now pause for a moment. 
We can only imagine that the disciples following along with Jesus did exactly, probably, what Matthew's Gospel notes. That they realize who has just arrived, and they fall face first in the dirt and scream like their 13-year-old selves. That was funny. Come on. Give me that. <laughs> Thank you. Woo. We're getting somewhere this morning. All right. But their attention is not solely focused on the two men who have appeared, but on the transformation, the transfiguration of their pal, their comrade, their <coughs> Jesus. Author Frederick Beekner writes, It was Jesus of Nazareth, all right, the man they had tramped a many a dusty mile with, whose mother and brothers they knew. They'd even seen him hungry, foot sore, tired, just as all the others. But it was also the Messiah, the Christ, in all of his glory. It was the holiness of the man shining through his humanness, his face so afire that they were almost blind. I mean, play. Jesus looks up at Elijah and Moses, two of the most important prophets of the Old Testament, and Jesus wonders aloud. I'm scared about what comes next. Am I really ready for what my father has asked me to do? His worried eyes turn over to Moses. Does death hurt? To Elijah, his voice finds a little bit more strength. What does it feel like to be taken to heaven? But with smiles on their faces and love pouring from the light that encompasses all of them, the two saints of old say this, While you may feel alone in the journey ahead, know that it will never be so, because we go with you. We will walk by your side, and when death comes, we will be there to welcome you again to the glory of the Father we stand in now. And just as the patriarchs breathe in, almost like they have one more thing to say, one more answer to Jesus' question, Jesus anticipates that, waiting for those final thoughts, right as they turn to leave. Peter breaks the prayerful concentration with his desire to capture the moment. Master, it's good for us to be here. I feel awkward right now. But I want to build a tent for you, for Elijah and for Moses. But as the text tells us, he has no idea what he's saying. While Peter's request may seem somewhat logical, if we want to capture a moment, put it into a frame, literally putting it in a box, it is God's voice that places the punctuation on this scene of transfiguration. This is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. So why have I painted that little bit different picture? Because we've all been there. We have all been in places of transformation, transfiguration. And it is not always pretty. And I am here to remind each of us of the promise of the one we are instructed to listen to. And remember, I am with you always, to the very end of the age, he says. Christ has been there and come back. He has faced fear and is here to offer us peace and guidance. He has been to the depths of hell for our sake, faced the greatest of temptations, and stared death in the face, and by his blood, he has given to us the gift of everlasting life for the sake of love, for the sake of love for you, his love for me, and his love for the world. He has promised to walk this journey of life with us. He has assured us by our own baptisms that he will encounter our life alongside us as one who understands its ups and downs, as one who gets its celebrations and its sorrows. So 
so that when we, when we find ourselves in places of transfiguration, it might be His light that shines through us. And it might be His hope that carries us through. You see, the transfiguration of Christ is more than just a moment for His disciples of all time to see His glory, to experience His holiness. It is a moment when we can all enter that holiness and be set free. Sisters and brothers in Christ, be transfigured by the promises of Christ and through His own death, resurrection, and ascension, through His experience as God in human flesh. Be renewed to live as one who is claimed, who is forgiven, and who is sent to shine for all the world to see. 